variety pack. Food and friends with Canada's best. From east to west, there and back. Eat North Variety Pack. Cause variety's the spice of life. All right, we are back for another episode of Eat North Variety Pack. Marilyn, Mike, how are you guys doing today? Good. Good afternoon. Nice to see you again. So how's the weather treating you? I feel like it's finally getting nicer in Calgary. So I, I went out for a bike ride the other day, and I'm feeling I'm feeling not not too bad. Marilyn, you want to go first? And, and I'm freezing my ass off here in Toronto, so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We finally have really good weather here in uh, Winnipeg, too. I actually just got back from a walk uh, with my son, and it's uh, been great outside, hopefully getting a bit of color. Uh, I feel as though I've been, like, shut in for about a month. So, uh, yeah, I'll take it. I, I honestly wish I could be webcamming from outside. Well, may maybe next week we'll be able to do uh, a show live from our own backyards. Wearing sh well, admittedly, I am already wearing shorts, but we can wear shorts in a more appropriate atmosphere. I'll take it. <laughs> yeah. So... Um Sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. You, you go ahead. Your turn. I was going to say, uh, so it's it's week six. Mm -hmm. What do you guys miss the most about uh, being in the real world? Uh, if I can start, you know what I really miss is uh, eating on a bar top in a bar, yes. you know, with a glass of wine. And my one fear is when we go back, you know how there's the glass partition everywhere you go now from grocery stores? And bar counters could be a good I... Uh... I miss everything about going to restaurants. Obviously, you know, it's it's my it's my work to to dine out and travel across Canada. And I feel like right now we just aren't able to do to do any of that. And uh, as much as I do love ordering takeout and bringing home interesting food from all these different local restaurants, it's it nothing can replace the the vibe of a restaurant. You know, Mike and you know, I love Segovia and Winnipeg and, you know, sitting at the bar there having some tapas and some wine. It's you can't replace that with a home meal, I don't think. Okay, so as the home cook in the group here, um, I'm missing entertaining. I'm missing having my friends over. Mm -hmm. um, I do a lot of experimenting on them. So, I mean, I'm missing the experimentation. I'm missing that whole social. So mm -hmm. my husband and I are doing kind of date night uh, where we, you know, we're actually trying to sit at the dining room table and have a lovely meal with wine and the whole shebang instead of just watching the news and, you know, right. feeling like the the world is over. So, uh, yeah, trying to make those special things. I, I really do miss, I miss entertaining. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you're right too. I, as much as I like to go into restaurants, I also have a lot of dinner parties. I love cooking for people. So with that aspect, it's also, yeah, again, to take out food and cooking for your partner doesn't always fill, fill that void. I don't think. Well, you know what we have been doing is that what? we've been Skyping. So we, we're doing happy hour mm -hmm. on Fridays and Saturdays. And so we Skype a, another couple. Mm -hmm. And so they have their drinks and their appetizers yes. and we have ours and then we just like it's really quite fun actually uh yeah i mean it's as fun as we can do so we're, we're making the best of it um speaking of which yes. okay is there a pet peeve of yours that you're not missing uh when you do like around eating <coughs> and people are eating because mine is i can't stand when people talk with their mouth full like yes. it's like <laughs> it's like i just want to die it's like you know no, like, please yeah. cover. I don't want to see what you're chewing. So I don't miss that. <laughs> mm -hmm. no, I think anything mouth related for me with the uh, dining companions, just loud chewing in general. I could maybe, uh, you know, I'm fine. There's no loud chewers in this household right now. So I'll, I'll stick with that. And, uh, you know, it, when people are like hurt to wait staff, I don't, I certainly don't miss, that. I, you know, none of my dining companions do that. But I always feel the shit you look over at another table and you just see someone like, you know, not bothering with the basics of please and thank you or making friendly conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I agree with that. I, I'm a, I'm with Marilyn with you on that pet peeve. Also, people that chew with their mouth open is this, I, and I think sometimes people forget they're doing it, and so I can you know forgive them once or twice. But I feel like there's a couple people in my life that I won't go out for dinner with anymore because of that, <laughs> that, that habit. And even after pointing it out, just can't seem to correct it for whatever reason. So. And so it's you're gonna call get the worse. herd. You're calling yes. the herd. Yeah, but it's only gonna get worse because everyone's eating alone right now. We're with their family. Where I guess uh, a lot of your rules go out the window. So there's gonna be a lot of people chewing. I think with their mouth open when this. Yeah, uh, yeah. wearing sweat. Yeah, no, the man the manners are gone. So so with us cooking more at home, I feel like obviously we're going to the grocery stores 
still relatively often, but I'm just wondering for you, has it changed where you grocery shop? Because uh, multiple major grocer locations in Calgary have had COVID-19 related cases. They haven't necessarily closed operations, but they have had workers that have had it. And you just, these days you just need to be so, so much more careful. So I find myself that I am shopping at smaller grocers. How about you? Uh, here in Toronto, Scott's doing the, you know, uh, they, they said they should, you should only have one person per family to mm-hmm. offer. Mm-hmm. And, and so Scott is that for us. But we do, uh, we're trying to go up to, we always shop at Vincenzo's. It's a little Italian grocery store. So we're really making sure that they stay in business. Mm-hmm. So we try to go up there to get our produce. And uh, I stay outside and he goes in and then we, we walk home. Mm-hmm. So nothing's really changed that much for us because we always kind of did that i'm just maybe spending right. more money yeah. Right. yeah good for them yeah. for us we'll do one click a week give or take and uh all the other stuff because we're in Wolf, Winnipeg, which is mm-hmm. a nice little with a bunch of really great little stops uh so i'll i'll actually venture out and do most of our grocery shopping which i wouldn't normally do as much mm-hmm. uh but my wife is due in june so we're obviously being very careful about uh you know as much contact as you know she's she'd be allowed to make outside of the house so yeah we, we're uh, a lot of the small ones here too you can call them up and do your order right over the phone hmm, and just kind of it up in the box, so it's pretty easy like that yeah it def- definitely makes it easier and i guess still at the end of the day there are certain things you can't always find at a smaller grocer that you do have to go to a bigger grocer but i just find it interesting that i am leaning more towards uh smaller scale grocery stores than than i was previously before so but it's it's beyond me. Costco always has a line of two hundred people outside. It blows my mind. I don't. Costco is like the place to shop in Calgary. Still, I feel like. Yeah. No, I'm I'm terrified to go. Yeah. So well, Scott would go anyway, but I'm yeah I'm not sending him there. Yes. No. <laughs> absolutely not. So I think this is a perfect time to bring on our first guest. Uh, she's a, a very talented chef and restaurateur from Vancouver. Her name is Dawn Doucette. She owns Deuce Diner on Vancouver's North Shore, and it's a great, really beautifully designed diner. And they do really great brunch, really great lunch. And they just recently pivoted also to do dinner takeout as well. So I'm going to bring Dawn on here. Hello. Hello. <laughs> How are you doing, Dawn? I'm fantastic. That's great to hear. And so you're you're in the diner already. You're getting ready for a, a busy day of takeout service. Yeah. So we um, we closed for two weeks, and then uh, just so I could wrap my head around what we could offer, um, you know, not knowing like everybody else how long this will go on for. So um, we opened up for dinners. This will be our fourth week now, and I thought offering some of our um, lunch items would probably, you know, add value as well. So mm-hmm. it'll be our say a lunch service today so okay. we'll serve lunch from 12 to 3 and then our dinner our chicken dinners from 4 to 7 30 because we can't accommodate both services unfortunately uh, if you could see it's a very tiny little kitchen right. and um so we're pretty excited you know we're known for sort of our, my menu originally is just it's very small farm to table uh, all breakfast lunch and brunch uh, seven days a week People miss our milkshakes, so we thought we'd bring back our yummy milkshakes and our espresso coffees uh, throughout the whole day. Mm-hmm. And we've been paired up with some local breweries so we could sell some six, six packs of beers and so forth. I think it goes well with our free run, crispy run chicken packs here. So it's, yeah, it's, it's going well. It's some long hours. We only have a few staff, right. and um, we're kind of doing it all. I feel like, you know, we'll, we'll come. I think May is our first year anniversary, mm-hmm. so we're not very new. So I feel like I'm right back at square one and getting right in there and getting my hands dirty. But it feels great. I find a lot of therapy making my biscuits and sharing recipes. Well, John, where I'm, I was originally from, uh, I lived in Vancouver and I lived in the North Shore. Where where are you located? So we're um, we're right on Pemberton and 15th, a block from the original Cactus Club. So we're not an A location, but I think we've created quite a little destination. And uh, our intent, my husband and I, was to just uh, do a little lipstick reno. But once he started tearing down walls, it became this big, you know, renovation. And my sister, it was her first uh, restaurant that she designed. And I think she hit the mark. Like, we really wanted to go back to that 50s, 60s diner, but make it modern. So the only thing we salvaged were the stools that were originally here. Cool. Yeah, the beautiful Oh yeah, there we go. A little peek at the space. It's, it's kind I, I of love all the accent wall. It's it's fantastic. It's uh, 
it's a really great vibe. I've been there many times and I feel like when you walk in, which I usually have to wait for a seat because it's that busy, which is great. Um, it just it does sort of take you back to a yeah, retro diner vibe, but still like the, the design touches in your restaurant, I think are beautiful. So your sister did a wonderful job. Thank you. Yeah. What's the uh, biggest uh, transition to doing mainly takeout? Like I always wonder in my head, like how much prep do you know going in? Because you're not, you know, you don't like normally you're a brunch place with the lineup outside the door, as Dan was saying. So it's yeah. like all go how how do you reflect that on takeout orders now yeah that's a good question we had we didn't know what to expect to be honest so my first week i was ordering a lot of chicken and mind you we're ordering a local uh, free run chicken here in vancouver and we were butchering it, butchering it ourselves we still are so we could save the backbone in order to make chicken stock to make our gravy and uh i'll tell you i think i got some serious carpal tana but i finally picked up some of those uh chicken shears and they make a world of a difference um, so we actually were running out. So even though we were running four nights a week as opposed to seven, um, I would just run out. I would put a cap on each day. Say I had 20 to 34 pack uh, dinners. I would say that's all I had. And then I would, because we built our own online online ordering platform on our website mm -hmm. through our designs, you know, it was another expense that we didn't want to endure, but we right. knew that we needed to be on top of this. Um, I did extensive research on the skip the dishes and the uber eats and, and to be honest i'm just a little guy little gal and uh you know when they're taking 25 to 30 percent of your profits it really you know hit home mm -hmm. so you know so we had this online ordering and the incentive we had was if people picked up curbside you know they'd get a discount and that's what we're doing we're starting to make no donations now that we're at a better place mm -hmm. Again, to get back to your question, so we kind of have an understanding where our volumes are now. We could definitely advertise more. Um, a lot of uh, we get a lot of regulars coming in here and supporting us, which is fantastic. Um, so we're really catering to the North Van and West Van community. Um, but yeah, so we run out, we run out, and you know, unfortunately, I got to say to our guests, well, you have to come back next Thursday. So <laughs> and so we don't hang out. So how long do you see this takeout model, delivery model sustainable for you, especially with um, delivery apps taking fees, which I should point out, if people are ordering takeout or delivery, if you feel comfortable, you should definitely lean towards takeout because that will um, that will give the restaurant a bit more, give a bit more cash flow. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think too, um, you know, I've been talking to some other colleagues and so forth, and I think even when they start taking off all these restrictions, I think we will see our dining rooms too. Uh, half the half the masses mm -hmm. and with every second table so it's and I think we'll rely on some of that takeaway still mm -hmm. and maybe creating more of a scene outside if we still allow it to wow. have and still you know for me having a breakfast and brunch place I never wanted to take out when I first mm -hmm. opened because I thought the integrity of our dishes you know we make everything to order yeah. and I would hate for someone to get an eggs benny on our lovely biscuits and get home mm -hmm. and it's just not the same mm -hmm. and I don't want or our waffles, they'll get soggy. Mm -hmm. So it was really, I had to bite the bullet on that and say, what can I offer that people aren't actually making at mm -hmm. home? Not a lot of people make fried chicken at home. Mm -hmm. You know, we're going back to the roots too. And, and you know, a lot, you know, we make our own hot sauce, our zucchini pickles, the biscuits and all that to make it comforting, I guess. Mm -hmm. So it'd be interesting to see what happens, but I, I think this will carry on for a while. And I think people are really gonna know their boundaries mm -hmm. and, uh, and really, you know, watch what they're picking up or what they're seeing. It's it's hard to say, but right now people are happy that they don't have to cook. How's that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah but you're also making like a, like what you said. It's comfort food, and I think you really hit the nail on the head with that. You know, I mean, biscuits and chicken and gravy. I mean, that that's comfort food. So yeah. you made a smart shift. You know, so good on you for you. going with the flow and, and embracing the change instead of fighting the change. Yeah. You know, when you accept it, I think you get to be more creative too. So mm -hmm. good, good yeah. on you. And it's about adapting. It was like, you know, how can I fly, you know, the Deuce Diner brand? Well, why not have a Deuce Coop of our own mm -hmm. and feed our flock? So that's mm -hmm. something we, we emphasize on and it's, it's going well for us and uh, it's not for everybody. You know, we still get our vegans asking if we could do something vegan. I said, all our, our sides are vegan and gluten free, but we'll get there. The more demand and more questions asked and, you know, we'll try to adapt that way, too. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, Don, you're actually going to make a breakfast sandwich with me in the kitchen in a little bit. So yep. why don't I let you go get set up for that? But again, I thank you so much for chatting with all of us. You know, it's always great to have a restaurateur's inside, especially during these times. So.
Thank you. Thank you yeah. for having me. Yeah, for sure. Stay well. See you in a bit. <laughs> All right. Cheers. Uh, Bye. I, I, I love Dawn. I love what she stands for with her business, and she really cooks from the heart. She's had a, a really interesting career path, too. She was formerly a development chef for the Earl's Restaurant Group, so she helped to bring a lot of different menu items to life through that and also helped put together their cookbook that came out, I think, about five years ago now. So she's done some really, really interesting things. No, she's, you could tell. I mean, I've never met her before, but... Um... You know, I've got West Coast blood, so mm -hmm. I could tell she's a West Coaster, even if she wasn't born there. But you could just feel it. So uh, yeah. I, I wish it well. I, I wish everybody in the restaurant business well. It's it's a scary time. Yeah, no, it absolutely is. So our, our next guest is a very well well known restaurateur based half in Toronto, half in L.A. She runs the Gusto 54 restaurant group. Janet Zuccarini is also a judge on Top Chef Canada. And before we bring her on to say hello, I'm just going to play a little clip of her providing some feedback to a contestant on the first episode of Top Chef Canada, season eight. Adrian's croquette is a really nice spice level. It's just a little bit of heat. He rolled whole crickets into that, he said. He roasted them, he smoked them, he ground them up. The flavors on this dish pop. But the mushroom wrapped in zucchini is really 1978. But crickets are so 2025. Cricket is so of the next decade. I'm happy that somebody went that far into the future of how we're going to be eating. Ooh. I love that quote. Uh, Janet Zuccarini, thank you so much for joining us today. Great to be here. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no, we're happy to have you. So we're now two episodes into Top Chef Canada season eight. Uh, how are you liking how things are turning out in the, the final product? I think with every season, you know, we get more comfortable, you know, the judges and we're friends and we have more fun with it. And I think that shows and in the show and, um, you know, this this season's my favorite season. So a lot of new twists, a lot of new challenges that we've never seen before. And so I think it's a really great season. I think, <clears throat> pardon me. Um, so the second episode comes out on Monday night on Food Network. No, third episode Monday night. Hard to keep track here. Uh, I feel like there's some clear front runners already. I'm a huge fan of Stephanie o Ogilvy from Halifax as well yep. as Francis Blaze from uh, Montreal. It's been interesting, and I feel like in the first episode, I love the idea of making the chefs think 10 years, 15 years in the future to cook cook a dish. And what, what do you think is a food trend of the future? Yeah, that was really the whole theme of uh, this season, mm -hmm. was really how people want to eat and what they want to eat in a new decade, right? Really looking at 2020. I think trends that have been popular, getting more popular, mm -hmm. definitely moving towards plant-based. If you are going to eat protein, make sure that it's very healthy form of protein, grass-fed. Eat less protein if you're going to have mm -hmm. animal protein. Taking days off, uh, going vegan uh, for certain days. You know, maybe it's Monday uh, that you go vegan once a week. Uh, alternatives to protein. Mm -hmm. So crickets. So Adrian in episode one, using this protein that is becoming more and more popular, uh, you know, and better for the planet uh, is, is, is how we have to be thinking right now. How can we be kind to ourselves, kind to the planet and, uh, you know, knowing where your food is coming from, is eating far more uh, like hyper local, hyper seasonal. So I think these are all, um, you know, all of the trends at the forefront. No, I, I absolutely agree. And so during this this time, this current pandemic, uh, you know, every restaurant's struggling. We don't have to tell everybody that, but you're in a somewhat of a unique situation because you own a restaurant in LA, Felix in Venice Beach, arguably one of the most sought after restaurants in the entire city, as well as many restaurants in Toronto. So how has COVID affected you in the two different countries? Felix in LA, is a, it's a hard reservation to get. And we would not do takeout at all. You know, right. fresh pasta. Evan really wanted people to experience it in the proper way, sit down in the restaurant. We pivoted in four days. Um, oh, gosh. <laughs> that's, that's the magic of live streams. It's good. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's good. I don't know what to do. They're going to keep ringing the doorbell today. Todd, yeah, you, can, you, can, you can get the door. You can, that's fine. Todd, Mike and I can chat help. You. help me. <laughs> you can you can definitely get the door if you want. We can chat for a second. Okay, thanks. Yeah, okay, okay. Um, 
even during COVID. Janet Zuccarini, very busy person. But it's I do think it's really interesting that she does have restaurants in two different countries because I can't really think of any other uh, Canadian-based restaurateurs that have that situation right now. Anyway, okay, there we go. At least I didn't have a little kid come. No, I got it. The doorbell was my face. <laughs> no worries. So anyway, so back back to the, the topic. Okay, where was I? Oh, talking about the pandemic, yes. the global pandemic, yeah. right? Um, b basically, Felix pivoted in four days, mm -hmm. and we, you know, changed the menu around, obviously to do takeout and delivery in a very safe way, and um, you know, you're going to make a fraction of what you made as a sit-down restaurant. And we knew that. So Felix is doing okay. I think we're at about 50% of our revenue pre-COVID. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the best that you can do in a takeout and delivery model. I, I don't, I can't see doing better than that. In Toronto, we shut down eight operations, mm -hmm. uh, temporarily laid off 700 people. Wow. We decided to close Toronto fully uh, before the government mandated us to close. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, taking revenue stream in Toronto to zero and I, and I have four other projects under construction. So I have four other restaurants half baked out there, like all of my cash out on construction sites. It was just for me personally, a very bad time in the history of my company, 24 years uh, being in the restaurant business. I've never closed a restaurant. They're all going super strong. But this was my year of growth. This was my year that, you know, I was going for it mm -hmm. and opening five restaurants in 2020. So, you know, right now in Toronto, we just pivoted. We're, we're in day, call it day eight of slowly opening up the restaurants for takeout and delivery and pivoting to also offer groceries, uh, meal kits, family meals. So I think in this, uh, time, everyone who's been affected has to pivot, has to be creative. You have to find ways to offer people what they want. Mm -hmm. So across our restaurants, we're lowering the prices. Our competition right now are grocery stores. So lowering the price point, um, you know, offering even essentials that people are finding a hard time to find in grocery stores. Grocery stores are overwhelmed right now. Absolutely. And I found that in LA, I would order something and they're delivering one week out. I'm like, well, I can't wait a week for the groceries. So I'm kind of being forced to go to grocery stores. I haven't felt safe going to grocery stores. The protocols are getting stricter and stricter to how they operate. Mm -hmm. But um, let's say I'll, I'll pick up food at Felix. We have four people working in the entire restaurant, everybody with gloves, masks on. You can't walk into the restaurant. You just pick up your bag, kind of a curbside pickup. So it's so safe. So I think that we can run restaurants in a safer manner than some grocery stores can right now. I agree, 100%. So, yeah, we're, we're pivoting and, um, again, realizing we're going to probably do in Toronto, you know, at a maximum 40% your free COVID revenue and it's, the goal certainly is not to make money right now it's to stay alive to stay afloat to give people jobs um and so we're, we're working around the clock i've never worked harder than than right now we're working around the clock to figure out everything from a government perspective has there been a market uh, like difference between how california has been treating restaurants versus say how uh, ontario is like is there a whole different set of rules there are a whole different set of rules. I think that perhaps Canada is looking to the U.S. and they're about two weeks behind in what they're offering. So right now, the U.S. has offered, um, basically it's a small business loan, uh, which is partially, or the full thing can be forgivable depending on how you use it. So this loan basically can cover off landlords. You can pay your rent. Because, you know, landlords also need to, to be paid. Mm -hmm. Canada just announced that they will be offering some kind of rent relief for landlords. But the U.S. has already created this package. Again, um, you know, that, the, that loan, that first round was over in a day. Right. And they ran out of cash. They just refunded that. And there's been lots of problems, right? 
uh, banks cherry picking their best customers, mm -hmm. who they're giving the loans to. It's supposed to be first come, first serve, but that's not the case. And they, you know, I'm sure you guys have seen it in the news. Harvard getting money. They've now said they're giving it back. Shake Shack, which is a, um, a publicly held company mm -hmm. that has stockpiled cash. You know, they're handing back their loan. So just a lot of people who didn't need it got the loans. 6% um, of restaurants were able to get those loans. 6%. What, you know, what... It's such a low number. Yeah. Restaurants do, all the small businesses. So it's messy, but this is what I want to say. There is a balance between the economy and people's health. Mm -hmm. And I think when people say, shut it all down... Uh, just shut it all down and we're going to wait this out. Well, you can't shut it down and print money. There has to be this balance. And in my view, what I'm doing is I'm getting antibody tests for my teens to get the antibody test. Why Canada does not have these tests? You know where I'm getting the tests from? A Canadian company has shipped these antibody tests to the U.S. That's I'm getting it from a Canadian company, but Canada cannot get these tests, which is absolutely absurd to me. And the smartest thing I think to do is get people tested. If they have the antibody, we know that they have some built-up immunity for a certain period of time, and they can safely come back to work. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm going to know about two chefs today who just got tested. Evan Funky, my chef at Felix, he was really sick in February, so we got him the antibody test and another chef de cuisine. If they they're getting their test results back today. They should have tested positive. Imagine the relief they will feel going to work, you know? Um, and other countries are issuing immunity passports. So I'm trying to get all my teams tested in Toronto. I'm reaching out everywhere. I mean, why we don't have these tests? It's kind of, don't you feel like the government has failed us? Well, I, feel like I, I, agree with, I agree with you. I, I, we, so many of my restaurateur contacts, you just see everyone struggling. And, and I, and even the antibody test you just brought up, it's kind of fascinating that that would be produced in Canada, but not available, readily available to Canadians. And I, f I feel like you're such, you are such an impassioned restaurateur that you are taking these extra steps too. But there's probably so many that just, if you are an, oops, sorry, if you're an independent restaurateur and you only have one restaurant, it's probably hard to even keep up with, with support or making sure you know, everyone's tested. Do you think it's realistic for a really small one-off restaurant to be able to to do this, to get through this, and take proper precautions? Um, I think that you know, there's going to be restaurants that do not make it through to the other side, and we see every day restaurants closing. So if we can look at this, let's say us in the hospitality industry, that we're all in this together, and our bankers are our partners and our landlords are our partners. And if we let go of how our pre-COVID life was and everybody making a lot of money and everyone's you know, really in, in great shape mm -hmm. here financially, and then we say, listen, can we all take this hit together? You know, Landlords telling me right now that, that I have to start paying them rent, let's say even on a construction site, and I'm like, here are the keys. Mm -hmm. That construction site is yours. I will not pay rent on a construction site nor will I pay full rent for the next two years on any of my restaurants. Mm -hmm. I have to go to my landlords and say, look, we're going to be making a fraction of the income for two years. So we have to renegotiate all of our leases. So we are around the clock just renegotiating. And the landlords that do not want to um, come in and take the loss with me, they want to come in when the times are good, but they have to come in with me now when the times are bad. The landlords that don't want to do that, they can take the keys and I will find another location mm -hmm. and there'll be plenty of locations available. Mm -hmm. People that hold real estate are in bad shape. Rest, and I tell the landlord this, if it's not, if you don't want to hold off on rent and give me a little break here, ask yourself who's coming in my place. Is another restaurateur coming in my place? Mm -hmm. Are you going to get, are you going to get, Another retail store. Have you seen like ne Neiman Marcus just filed for bankruptcy? Retail. We're all in such bad shape. Mm -hmm. So that's the plea. People that don't, I will, I will happily, not happily, forced to walk away because mm -hmm. what, what, what am I going to pay them for rent when I'm making thirty to forty percent of my revenue? It's yeah, not the, the world. It's not the world that 
we live in right now. It's a different world. So accept this new reality and let's be in this together and work together as a team. But people who want 100% of their life pre-COVID and money that they had pre-COVID, they're not going to get it. Yeah, no, I agree. Mike, anything else? Well, that covered that one. Uh, on a lighter note, how about uh, just for Top Chef, what has been your all-time favorite dish? Or you know how the, the show airs, obviously, quite a, quite a while after um, you were originally filming it. Like I was on MasterChef years ago. Do you even remember some of the dishes before they come up? And you're like, oh, my God, this, this one. Yeah, yeah, you definitely remember. You remember the really bad ones and the yeah. really good ones. Nothing in between. <laughs> Everything in between is a little bit of a blur, but yeah. that spectrum, right? You, you definitely remember the dishes. My favorite is going to be the finale of this season. So everyone's going to have to watch, but it was definitely the finale and the winner. That was all time favorite. I'm excited to watch. So uh, last question before we let you go, Janet. And again, thank you so much for your time. I know you're, you're very busy. Um, wh what's one thing uh, a food loving Canadian can do to support a local restaurant right now uh, outside of takeout? Like what obviously restaurants need support from all levels of government. So how can a, a foodie uh, do that for the restaurants they love? Well, you know, support supporting and yes, you know, doing takeout, you know, we need some revenue. Of to course. keep afloat, keep the jobs going, and um, it, it's like letting the government know that you know they want the restaurants mm -hmm. back. I know a lot of people are in in rough shape, so it's hard to say like, oh, you know, people people should mm -hmm. be thinking about restaurants right now. But if uh, they want to see their favorite restaurants come back, it's sending letters to the government. It's um, supporting us through buying our food. Um, posting, doing your social media posts to let people know that we are open for business and help generate the, the buzz. Really just anything, you know, anything right now. Yeah. And I know I'm ordering takeout as much as is reasonably possible within a week, you know, just trying to balance out from cooking at home too. But uh, I, again, I, I do agree. Cash flow is so important for restaurants. So takeout does allow restaurants cash flow, which can help keep the lights on and keep them operating. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much, Jenna. It was amazing talking to you today. I really appreciate your insight on everything. Thank you. It was great. Thank you for having me and stay safe and stay healthy. That's what we say now, right? Yes, absolutely. And you as well. Thank you, Janet. Thank, thank you. you. And that was Janet Zuccarini, judge on Top Chef Canada and also a acclaimed restaurateur, the owner of Gusto 54 Restaurant Group. And she she really does some some amazing things. And I love how she's really become an advocate for the the industry as a whole. It's really important right now. Yeah, no, I, 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 uh, I, I thought her insight was amazing. Um, I just want to weigh in on one thing on CBC News last night. Yeah. They were talking about the testing. Okay. And, and one of the reasons why Canada is below behind is because of the amount of positive, of negative, uh, of, of false negatives. So it says that you have, you've had it or you haven't had it when in fact you did. And so until they can get that ratio better or the number that's why they haven't they're, they're still waiting on more tests so okay. um i understand what she's saying because mm -hmm. i i agree a thousand percent if i knew i was really sick in february too i mean and so does that mean that i had it and i don't have to be hiding in my house all this time so right. i know that something needs to be done i just think the reason that we're kind of behind is because they're they want to make sure that those those false positives those false negatives are not as big so mm -hmm. no absolutely that's what the news said. I'm just I'm just telling what the news said last night because I was really curious about that too. It's, it can be hard to keep up with all this news in in general. There's just so much noise, so it's, it can be hard to stay exactly up to date. You know? But, yeah. 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 As you're saying, like that was the thing between this and like the flu, the, like some people's symptoms, right? Or who are asymptomatic, who barely had any symptoms. Like you're just wondering. Like we came back from California. We all had a cold for a bit uh, in February, and you wonder the same thing too. And obviously, you know, it would be a relief to know um, and it would certainly change. But you also, I guess you don't want to change people's behaviors when they're out in public as it is right now anyways, right? Yeah. 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 And I think, Mike, you bring up a really good point. It's that A system, uh, you know, like you don't have any symptoms, but you're a carrier. And right. so I wish we could find out who those people were. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, we'll just like seclude them. <laughs> so, but, you know, that's the dilemma. And I know that's what all the scientists are trying to figure out. So I'm, mm -hmm. I'm hanging in with them. 
On on a lighter note, I think that we have Chef Don Doucette ready in the kitchen to make a breakfast sandwich with me. So I'm going to shift back to her, and then we'll come back, and then we have one last guest, uh, country singer Kristen Carter. Okay, I think Dawn is now ready in her kitchen. I love that neon sign. Hi, Dawn. Welcome back. I think we're maybe going to move the camera over just a little bit to the right. Yeah, perfect. Okay. So so now we're, we're at Deuce Diner. You're all about delicious brunch and lunch food. So what are we going to make today? Today we're going to make our breakfast salmon. Mm -hmm. So it has an easy over egg or a scrambled egg with a little vintage cheddar on our homemade brioche toasted buns. Sounds good to me. So for you, what makes the perfect breakfast sandwich? For me, it's it's all the components, you know, less is more, having a really good bun, which is our uh, sweet brioche uh, uh, bun from our local bakery. Really good eggs with dark yolks. Uh, obviously not overcooking your eggs if you're gonna do it over easy. Mm -hmm. And just some really good uh, aioli, a little bit of arugula and Bacon, we always, uh, we have avocado or bacon. So just not a lot of components, mm -hmm. make sure you cook well. So if, if I was going into the grocery store and I want to buy a good quality egg, what am I looking for? Um, generally uh, eggs that are um, probably a dark yolk mm -hmm. or a farm egg, something mm -hmm. that's uh, not your, your regular oversized egg, I guess. I like to use extra large here at the diner mm -hmm. for waffles and batters and so forth. but. And I do like dark yolk because I love seeing the dark yellow color. Yes, it is beautiful for sure. So so when you are buying eggs at the grocery store, do you think that price point is something you should look for? Like the, the more expensive the egg, generally the better quality? I hate to say it, but yes. Yeah. With most, thing, most things. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> All right. Well, well, why don't you show me how you make the perfect breakfast sandwich and I'll kind of ask you some questions along the way. Okay. Okay. All right. So here we've got our... I put a little butter on our, our buns here, which we post up on the griddle. Um, and then we have a uh, um, paprika aioli, which is just a smoked paprika with a little bit of mayo and lemon. So I generally put a good amount. I'll show you what I'm done here. Oh, I'm hungry. I want to eat right now. Oh, right here. <laughs> and then we have a choice of either a scrambled egg. Well, actually, I put my proteins down. Mm -hmm. So what we'll do, I think, is we'll do a bacon. So we, we give a generous portion, beautiful uh, smoked bacon here we use at the diner. Uh, but I'll even double down here on a little protein here. Why not? And you know, it's bacon almost an avocado just for you, Dan. Yes, okay. Exactly. Thank and you, Dawn. Avocados. Perfect, nice too. Perfect perfect no one. brown spots because people don't like that. Yes. Okay, so we'll just uh, use our fancy little spoon here. Actually, that, that's a good question. So. When yep. you have avocados at the restaurant, how, how often do you find bad ones? Because like, so you always see people posting on social media about how excited they are to find a perfect avocado or, or a ripe one. Well, I, I think, too, it's, you know, knowing that the avocado is ripe. Right. You mm -hmm. don't want to use it when it's hard, right. obviously, because you're not going to get that velvety right. texture. Um, when it starts to get uh, wrinkly, if you will, you know that it's sort of past its prime. Mm -hmm. what fruit actually that have seeds and so forth mm -hmm. so just something that's quite firm but you can leave a little indent on the outside of the skin okay. if that makes sense okay. okay i guess now we're not supposed to touch our fruits and vegetables at the grocery store so we just hope for the best it will be like europe right <laughs> yeah i gotta touch and smell yes okay, so we have our patioli we have a little bit of bacon mm -hmm. we have an avocado now, Dan, would you like an easy over or scrambled? So do you want to just explain the difference between those two styles of eggs? I'm sure most people know, but just in case. Yeah. So with our scrambled eggs, we um, we, we generally prep our eggs uh, the morning of, and we mm -hmm. actually take whole eggs. We have no fillers or cream or anything. We Vitamix it. Mm -hmm. So we get some little aeration in our egg mix to make our omelet and our scrambled eggs. So when we're scrambling eggs, it's a little butter in a, a nonstick pan. And we're basically just using our spatula to guide the eggs through the, around the surface of the pan. Mm -hmm. And really, I think for, for us, I don't want to see any brown parts. Mm -hmm. I want it gorgeous. We've got gorgeous looking eggs with uh, yellow yolks. So really getting around the pan, if you will, and scrambling up and move it around. I like mine even a little loose, which means that I'm not going to cook it till it's like styrofoam, but I want it loose and it's, it is a bit runny. That's how I like my eggs. Some people are a little bit. I, uh, I do find it's it's a little bit like cooking certain types of meat, like pork. You know, back in the day, people would just cook it mm -hmm. cook it to death, and the people do the same with eggs. And I feel like when you have over scrambled scrambled eggs, they are they're dry. They are not desirable at all. So absolutely. Yeah. And you know, being at the diner here, like when they're they're doing volumes of eggs mm -hmm. and different dishes, 
you know, when like while well, you can talk about the over easy egg, we're doing this on the griddle, and it's really a a one minute egg, one and a half minute egg. Oh. So you're you're throwing it right on a 300 degree griddle, um, and then you're flipping it and putting your vintage cheddar over top. Because for me, again, I don't want to know. People will ask for over medium because they don't want the runny yolk. Mm-hmm. But I think what makes this uh, sandwich kind of exciting is when that yolk kind of drips down, and it's a childhood memory. Yes. We're licking your sleeve and. Not everybody likes that, yeah. but but it's, it also adds we, richness. I feel like you don't get the same kind of richness with a thoroughly cooked through egg, right? Like the yolk is a so it's almost like an extra sauce you weren't expecting. Exactly. Yeah. You know, you know how to do yeah. this. You know, know a thing or two. <laughs> so I'll, I'll go for the easy over, okay. which I've just kind of done a little Sounds bit good. here. And then I, oh, go ahead. Oh, it's already broken. Look at that. See, that's what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> so we have this. Yep. We have the easy over egg. And then we just finish it with just a little bit of uh, baby arugula because I think any sandwich needs a bit of green. And arugula definitely imparts a nice peppery note to it. Yeah, it definitely has a bite. Yeah, so we put a little bit of greens on here. Um, and then we have a little lemon vinaigrette, which we make in-house. Mm. We put on top of that. And then we just kind of close it off with the top of our bun. And really, that is it. That is one that? hell of a breakfast sandwich. All right. Oh, so, I just reached through. Oh. oh. <laughs> I can't eat it. You got it. You got it. Oh, and without these virtual saying, chats, it goes really good with our hot sauce. Oh, amazing! And so you just launched this breakfast sandwich on the menu on your takeout menu today, right? Uh, yep. Yeah, at uh, twelve o'clock, we are alongside our double deuce burger awesome. and our chicken sammy, and of course, all our milkshakes and espresso coffees. Great. Well, Don, you know I, I've been to your diner. I, I love it so much. So I wish you all the success. I know these are are trying times right now, but it's it's always great to chat with you. Well, thanks, sweetheart. Thanks for having me. Cheers. Uh, Dawn, Dawn is just the sweetest, isn't she? She's a natural on camera, too. <clears throat> I'm starving. <laughs> I'm starving. But, you know, you guys, I, I'm sorry, but I have to go. I okay. have another meeting that I have to go to, but I loved it. Uh, nice to see you guys. Yes. Wonderful show. I'll see you guys next week, okay? okay bye. Okay. See you later, Marilyn. Bye. Bye. There we go. Okay, so it's just me and you, Mike. Well, we have our final guest coming up here. Uh, her name is Kristen Carter. She's a Vancouver-based country singer phenomenal voice but in addition to being an amazing musician she's also pretty funny so i think i'm going to show you this little tiktok video she did recently where she reworked a song from tangled i don't know if you, have you been on tiktok i know we're too old but have you i haven't yet okay. uh we, we hired someone who is hopefully uh, gonna get us into it who's uh, younger than we are but uh Okay, so for now, we're going to bring in Kristen Carter on to chat with me in just a minute, but I'm going to play her cute little TikTok video first. 7 a.m., the usual morning lineup. Put on my sweatpants, sit, and then wait for JT. I'll make a coffee, do laundry, and eat and shine up. Eat again, and by then it's like 7.15, and so I'll read a book. Or maybe two or three I'll add a few new paintings to my gallery I'll play guitar, Netflix, and cook it basically Just wonder when can I leave my house That was great. Kristen Carter, how are you? Hello, I'm good. How are you guys? I'm good. You you post some pretty funny TikTok videos. I'm, I'm loving them. Oh, thank you so much. TikTok has been my favorite discovery of the quarantine, so it's been really fun. I bet. I, I keep joking that quarantine is the time when young people discover Twitter and older people use TikTok, so it'd be interesting to see. No, by the way, neither of you are too old for TikTok. Okay. Nobody's too old okay. for TikTok. Just get on there and have fun. It's such a fun app. Great. I'm really I enjoying it. I hope my partner's it. watching because he does not agree with that. So. Oh, okay. Uh, but, hey, anyway, um... You know, I first met you during the Canadian Country Music Awards when they were in Calgary this past September, and you, your your voice blew me away, and you've since come onto the country scene in such a strong way with your, your first single, Karma, which got uh, top 20 on country radio, right? Yeah. Which yeah, is... thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Yeah, it's been a crazy year for me, definitely. And um, to even be able to, like, put out a song into the world and then have people, you know, like it and want to play it and be able to kind of travel around and hear what people think of it has been something that's just totally incredible and a, and a dream for me. So it's been really exciting. No, it's it's a great song. And then uh, more recently, you released Home Tonight, which is a song that you actually wrote yourself. It's very heartfelt. Yeah, uh, thank you. Yeah, I wrote that with um, Kelsey Kuliak when I was down in Nashville. Um, and I just had one of those days where um, 
it's one of those days I think that everybody has where I was just up at 3 a.m. and I was like, why can't I sleep right now? And just staring at the ceiling and with my thoughts. And um, I just thought to myself, man, I just really want to go home. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't want to go home and like live with my parents necessarily, but I just want to go home for one day and reset um, and feel comfortable and just come back and, and try again tomorrow. Because I think some days can can be hard. And uh, those memories really give us a lot of comfort. So the next day, dead tired, I went to the right in the morning with Kelsey and uh, and pitched the idea. And, and then we kind of came out with that. And she had a lot of beautiful ideas to, to bring to that. And, and it just happened really quickly. Um, and it's one of my favorite songs I've written. So I'm really happy. To, um, I was able to share it and during a time when I think um, it brings people some some comfort memories like that. Which brings me to my next question. How are you staying creative, I guess, aside from TikTok, while you're, while you're cooped up? As a musician, what are you doing to stay creative? A lot of video content. So like the TikToks do take, even though they're like these tiny little snippets, like they take most of the day to get right and to record and kind of sing and put all together. But I'm really enjoying that. It's been really fun um, doing a lot of uh, singing. So I still record a lot and just post just some straight up songs uh, um, across different platforms that I have. Um, but outside of music, doing a lot of cooking, cooking my way through um, the Canadian Living uh, magazines I'm getting still, so that's been good. Uh, yeah, I was joking with my boyfriend that he said it's the best gift he's ever given because it's like now he just gets a bunch of like, meals. Um, so we're doing that and that's been fun. Um, and I work on a lot of, uh, I like to add to my outfits for different songs that I'm working on, different projects. So I painted some shoes um, and I ordered a whole bunch of little um, origami papers for an outfit that I'm planning. And I don't know if that was a complete impulse buy on Amazon. It's very debatable, um, but we'll see what happens. So. Well, I look forward to seeing that. And again, we can, we can check out your music and more of your looks on Kristen Carter Music on, on Instagram and YouTube, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah great. For sure. um, so I think you're going to play a, a brand new single for us, right? It's not even out yet. Uh, no, it's not out yet. It comes out tomorrow. Very so I'm exciting. really excited. I'm going to invite uh, my boyfriend to come yes, over. He's absolutely. Been <laughs> during between his conference calls, he's going to sit here and play for me. So. Great. Okay, well, I'll let you take it away. Just maybe introduce the song and just let's hear it. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so this song is called Double Take, and I'm really excited about it. Um, it was a pitch that came through to me. Um, it's written by Maren Morris, Shane McAnally, and Ross um, Copperman. So I'm just really excited that I was able to put my voice on the song, and I'm excited to play it for everybody today. So, yeah. yeah. Cool. Let's go. Whoa. 
amazing. <laughs> Chris and Carter, you are nothing but pure talent. I guess maybe just get you to move over just a little bit to your left. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> Don't mean to bump your microphone out, but thank you. <laughs> Beautiful compliment too. Uh, that that was amazing. You're such a talent, and I can't wait to see you just skyrocket in the industry. It's gonna be really fun to watch and listen to. So. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you. And that brings us to the end of a fifth episode of E North Friday Pack. Mike Green, thank you for joining us. Kristen Carter, it's been a fun Bye. show. Yeah. See you guys soon. Thank you guys so much. Bye. Thank you. Ciao. Bye.